for the wait. Uh, we did just run into a little bit of a technical difficulty, so thank you so much. Um, but well, good evening and welcome everyone. Um, on behalf of the museum staff, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome uh, to our audience viewers at home. And, um, and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Diane Shen and I'm the collection strategist for the Los Altos History Museum. And I'm so honored to be introducing our wonderful speaker this evening. Uh, before we go ahead and get started, I'd just like to thank my colleague, Dr. Amy Ellison, who is also on the call with us. Um, she's been providing some additional technical support. So thank you so much, Amy, uh, for your help, as well as uh, Diane Holcomb, my colleague, uh, who got the word out about this important event. So thank you so much, Diane. Tonight's program is really in celebration of Black History Month and remembrance of the tremendous courage and fortitude of uh, the early African-American pioneers in the Santa Clara Valley. The photographs and oral histories that we will learn about and see tonight, uh, this evening, are a culmination of 15 years of careful research and documentation of this local history. Um, I can definitely say that as a collection strategist that this type of archival research is the ultimate uh, labor of love uh, to making sure that these stories and, and records exist. So um, it's, it's really phenomenal the work that uh, Professor Adkins has done. Um, in that same spirit, uh, this program supports a new collecting initiative that the museum has embarked on um, that strives to document the history of race, immigration, and civil rights in the local region. Um, as we all know, Santa Clara County is home to one of the most diverse, multiracial, and multicultural communities in the United States. Um, and we are so proud to honor the stories that are too often left out of history books, buried in the archives, or worse, uh, forgotten. So as public educators uh, for a local history museum, we operate a public forum to bring to light uh, issues of institutionalized racism and to document struggles towards peace and equality uh, for historically marginalized populations. So we recognize that responsibility and uh, we're very proud to put on uh, these programs here at the museum. So through this initiative, we are actively collecting uh, personal memorabilia, artifacts, artworks, uh, letters, and materials that really illustrate uh, these vital contributions and stories that make up our community. Um, this year, alongside this initiative, we, uh, the museum has also hosted other Zoom webinars that you can definitely check out on our YouTube channel. Um, and we, we just did a talk on uh, the race and the suffrage movement with uh, Dolores Davidson, who's the professor of history and women's studies at Foothill College. And that talk examined the stark realities uh, that women of color had faced despite passing the women's right to vote in 1920. So before I introduce our speaker tonight, uh, just a few quick housekeeping items. Uh, firstly, this is a recorded webinar, um, so we cannot see or hear you. Uh, so please feel free to sit back and relax, enjoy. Um, we, if you have a friend or a colleague who was unable to join us this evening, um, this video will be available on our YouTube learning channel by the end of the week. Secondly, uh, following the lecture, we will immediately proceed into the Q&A portion of the event. Um, and so we encourage you to submit uh, your questions actually during the talk. Uh, at, down at the very bottom, you will see a Q&A uh, chat box. Uh, so please feel free to submit your questions throughout the talk this evening. We will be monitoring the questions and we hope to get to everybody's uh, questions. We hope to get everybody's questions answered. And last but not least, um, the museum is able to offer free programs like this webinar uh, because of our wonderful members and donors 
So if you're interested in becoming a museum member, uh, please be sure to visit our website at losaltoshistory.org to learn more about um, the awesome perks and benefits that come with your membership. So without further ado, um, we are so fortunate that our speaker has generously lent uh, her time to us this evening. And um, I'm so honored to introduce her. Born in Pullman, Washington and raised in Portland, Oregon, Jan Batiste Adkins is the author of African Americans in San Francisco, African Americans of Monterey County and African Americans of San Jose and Santa Clara County. She received her MA in Comparative Literature from San Jose State University, MA in Education from National University and BA from University of Oregon. She also has received certifications in education from MIT and writing from Stanford University. Professor Adkins has dedicated her career to teaching all ages from elementary to college students. She currently serves as an adjunct faculty member and lecturer at San Jose City College, where she has taught English composition, creative writing and literature for the last 13 years. Since publishing her research, she has widely lectured on the subject of African-Americans in the San Francisco Bay Area communities. So please join me in welcoming Professor Jan Batiste Adkins. I apologize, let me just... Uh... There Hello. you go, Jan. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness, the Zoom. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> Our, our new, the new existence, the new, the new way we communicate <laughs> in 2021. Anyway, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to share my research and the, my, the, the project that I, that I embarked upon in about 2007. And I haven't given it up yet. I, I'm still, <laughs> I'm still um, intrigued in studying the, um, the, in reading the stories of the African-American uh, early pioneers who traveled across the, the, the continent, ac across the United States rather, and came to the continent's end, California. And it's been really exciting for me. So today we're going to talk a little bit about my latest book, which is African Americans of San Jose and Santa Clara County. So I'm going to share my screen and we're going to begin with a PowerPoint of photographs, wonderful photographs. And I can begin to discuss my book as we, um, just a quick minute here, okay. Okay, so let me first let you know that this book was a labor of love because I'm a resident of San Jose. I, I after researching San Francisco and Monterey, I had so many questions about the families that travel from San Francisco down to uh, San Jose. And, and, and read stories about Santa Clara Valley. Uh, you know, this was in the 1860s, 1870s, and I, it was intriguing to me. And I, uh, so for me, I wanted to know a little, a little more about the San Jose community. So the first question I asked myself was, okay, well, when did African-Americans first come to Santa Clara County? Well, they came to, the Santa, to this valley long before it was even a part of the United States long before it was even a part of Mexico. So the first people of African heritage then began uh, settling in the valley in, seven, in the 1770s. And so that was the answer to my first question. When did the first black people of African heritage settle and make Santa Clara Valley their home? So to, before we get started, um, I just wanna say that the purpose of my work primarily is to inspire conversations. I want people to begin to, to learn about those early pioneers from various communities, various backgrounds, various ethnic groups, and then to begin and then, and then to begin to understand the struggles that those uh, pioneers had to overcome in order to establish their homes in California. Hopefully this book will inspire new ideas within the leadership of our communities to continue to build on economic, social, and cultural contributions 
that were established way back in the 1800s and will focus on, and, and that, that our leaders will focus on the overall history, cohesion, and the livability of San Jose and cities within Santa Clara County. So my book is divided into uh, six chapters. The first chapter addresses the early black pioneers, the chapter two, African-American church, chapter three, the 20th century community from the turn of the century, 1900 to 1950s, educational opportunities from 1950 through the 60s, and then opportunities for African-Americans in terms of technology, 1950s through 1990s. And then I like my last chapter six is dedicated to creating opportunities and opening doors. How we as a black community began to create opportunities for, uh, our, for, for our children and, and how we began to open doors uh, in coordination with the rest of the community here in Santa Clara County. So that's, so six chapters with approximately 180 photographs. These photographs are not, were, are photographs that uh, I was able to obtain from family albums, um, from historical societies. Uh, the, right there, your, your Palo Alto Historical Organization was so helpful in helping me to understand the stories of, of African Americans that uh, were documented in the Palo Alto Historical Society. Um, also museums, museums are were such a, the, the uh, San Jose History Museum and other museums throughout the state of California have been so useful in uh, providing the photographs. And then last but not least, libraries. So many of the photographs come from library archives and the archivists in the libraries throughout the state have been so wonderful in providing me with the photographs and the stories, backgrounds, uh, information, oral histories, and, and individual family records that, are, that have been housed in those libraries. And so the libraries of all over the state of California have been so helpful in providing me with the information that I needed in order to continue this research. So that's where the photographs are primarily. The, uh, oh, and I want to say that some of the uh, information too comes from not only primary source information, but some are very credible secondary source informations too, such as uh, San Jose State University History Department, Sarasu Academy, um, um, the from Monterey, the uh, University of California Monterey, um, not University, but Cal State Monterey, and other places where um, the colleges and universities were able to contribute some of their archival information, Stanford. Uh, so anyway, so, that was my first question. So when did people, where did they, when did people of African heritage begin migrating to California, specifically the Santa Clara Valley? The next question is, uh, who were these early pioneers? And then where did they come from? So these were the questions I began to ask myself about the, the early uh, families, early settlers. Well, here's the answer. Some of the early settlers started coming to California as early as 1777. And it wasn't known as California at that time, but this was under Spanish territory. And so five families came and, and helped to establish the Pueblo. Uh, and this was in 1777. So they were considered citizens of the very first town uh, of, of, uh, of the very first town. And this and so these were people who were of black and Spanish heritage and they were referred to as mulattoes. So the Spaniards were very careful in documenting the race and ethnicity. In some, in some cases, uh, some may have been of African descent and then others of Spanish descent and their children of course were mixed descent. And so that's, that was the, the, the whole point of the mulatto, the reference of the mulatto, uh, as well as the, the family being a mixed family. So it was another way of designating a mixed family, mixed heritage family. In the 1800s, the black population in Santa Clara Valley reached 87. This was about 1850, 1850, 1860. And so many of these people came of, of that population, the 87, many of these people were free men and women, black men and women, and some were enslaved men and women. And so we know that California was a free state and we'll talk about that a little later, what that really meant. Because I know as a student of history, as history was my first love, my first start at college, I, had, I, I didn't understand the term free state. So anyway, uh, that was really interesting. 
And then by, 19, by the 1900s, the African-American population reached 251 out of a total of 60,000 uh, population in Santa Clara County. So the numbers have been very small, uh, however, uh, very significant in terms of, of uh, the development of the black community. So this, here's a map of the Pueblo, land, Pueblo lands of San Jose. And so this was uh, the, the area. Um, now we, here is the map of the El Pueblo de San Jose de Guadalupe, which was considered the very first town. Uh, and this town was located, so this was a, a, a town uh, off of the, Gua, uh, the Guadalupe River, on the east side of the Guadalupe River. Uh, and so this was near the uh, Santa Clara Mission. And so in this town, um, as you see the map, there's a plot of, of the families of the land in which the families farm. So it, it, within each square is the name of the family, the man and woman of the family. Uh, and that was a plot of land that they were re responsible for farming. And they farmed this land and they, uh, they grew food that was provided for the Presidio in San Francisco, as well as the Presidio down in, in, uh, in um, Carmel. And then, um, and then, at, and also uh, the mission, the Santa Clara mission was also a, a place that, that was able to benefit from the food that was grown there at the, uh, at the Pueblo. So five of the 21 mulatto, uh, five of the 21 families were mulattoes. Well, we also know um, in terms of uh, Pio Pico, who was the first governor of, of Alta California under, under the Mexican rule, he had a cousin by the name of Antonio Maria Pico, and he was called the Alcade of the Santa Clara region and so uh, of the Pueblo. And so in 1830, he was the judge, the Alcade. And so he, he was of, of African descent. His grandmother was a mulatto. And so he comes and, and Pio Pico uh, was his first cousin. And so um, that was another person of African descent who had established himself. And there were, there were other people too, but that was the Pico family was probably the most renowned family that I found in my research. So in the 1850s, many free uh, men and women uh, of African descent came to Santa Clara Valley. They worked as servants, cooks, gardeners, miners, laborers, and farmers. And by the 1990s, uh, several porters, I'm sorry, 1900s, several uh, uh, people of African heritage came to the valley with the railroad and they worked as porters and lived near Mayfield, uh, near Palo Alto, lived in Mayfield at that time near Palo Alto. So to deal with the issue of slavery, so California was a free state, but what that meant was that it was that um, owner, um, plantation owners or, and farmers from the South were able to bring their slaves into California. And they were, and then they brought them into California to mine, uh, the gold, to gold, to mine for gold, and also to uh, help establish their homes and farm and agricultural purposes and things like this. Uh, but California had a law that said that they could only keep their, the, the, that owners could only, plantation owners could only keep their slaves in California on a temporary basis. So it was only on a short-term basis. And that would have been like three to four years or something like that. And, um, but California said they could not maintain a permanency in California. So what happened is that many slaves would either run away and become fugitive slaves, but we also have a lot of documentation that many slaves actually worked and bought their freedom. And the way they were able to buy their freedom is that those working in the mines were able then to, to, to work during the day for their particular owner, but then they worked at night for other, uh, for other miners and, and they were able to uh, make extra money on the side. And then they were able to buy their, their uh, freedom. I think the cost of freedom was about $1,000 because in, in all of the research that I've done for the three uh, different areas of uh, those slaves that were freed were free uh, for $1,000, they were able to buy their freedom. And so um, this is a case of the papers in front of you on the screen. Those are the, the manumission papers for Samson Gleaves. 
and it states he it states that further states that the same Samson Gleaves is forever free. So, and this happened in the state of California, County of Santa Clara. So what happened is that the abolitionists, so there was a quite a bit of an abolitionist movement in California, and both black and whites came together and, and did not want slavery established in California. And they fought for that, for, for the freedom of slaves. And so in this case, they came together and they went and they went to court. And they, in fact, the, the owner was, uh, was uh, his last name is Finley, and Finley owned um, a man, um, uh, Samson Gleaves, and the courts ruled that Samson Gleaves was a free man; that they could not he could not maintain slavery in California. So I found this document um, was uh, I actually was able to acquire this from History San Jose, and so there was another man by the name of Plim Jackson. There were two other children, but the the courts of Santa Clara County granted freedom to uh, slaves often. There was another case in San Francisco. Archie Lee and Archie Lee, uh, his owner put him back on the boat to send him back to Louisiana. And uh, Archie Lee uh, escaped escaped the boat. And and in San Francisco, many of the uh, abolitionists put him up in a in a I guess a boarding house or something. And then they took him to the courthouse. And the courthouse put him in jail and said he that the owner could not take him out until they went to court and had a trial. And and the Supreme Court of California released Archie Lee and gave and he and awarded him his freedom. And the reason is because they the owner was was trying to defy the laws of California and maintain a slave on an ongoing basis in California. And that was wrong. California was not, did not would allow slaves uh, uh, slaves in California on a temporary basis, but the owners had to agree to take them back to, to take them out. Um, here's a case of Jim Williams. And James Williams came to, to San Jose as a slave and he worked, he came to San Jose as a slave and worked as a miner. Uh, once freed, he was able to work at the mines and he, and he was able to buy his freedom. He was freed in, um, in the early 1800s, I'm sorry, in, 18, in the 1850s, early 1850s. And then he moved to uh, Murphy Ranch uh, here in Santa Clara County. He worked at Murphy Ranch for a long time and he was, he was considered to be one of the very first black residents of San Jose of the contemporary in the 1800s. Well, okay, so that addresses the question of slavery, but what about everybody else? Well, okay, so we had a wonderful person by the name of William Cassie who came to San Jose from San Francisco, but he also, he came from San Francisco from Philadelphia and uh, he was a member of the African Methodist Episcopal Church in Philadelphia. So he came to California and he became connected with the with Cathedral Episcopal Church, Trinity Cathedral Episcopal, Episcopal Church right here in San Jose, which is still exists today. Um, and uh, so what happened is that he was ordained at, at, by Trinity as a deacon in 1866. But the purpose of being ordained was for him to provide the serve as the church connection between the black community and and the church, and so his job was to minister to the to the spiritual needs of the small black community in San Jose. Um, so, William Cassie was an abolitionist. He helped to establish the what was called the Colored Convention and the Afro League in San Jose, and the, those groups and organizations helped to overcome some of the uh, black codes or laws that limited people of color, which would have been Asians, black and, and Indians could not, could not testify against a white person. So, so William Cassie, Peter William Cassie was uh, one of the organizers of this organization, which was to help to address the problems with the voting, with, uh, with um, I'm sorry, not voting, but with the testimony uh, laws in California. He also started two schools. So he started what was called St. Philip's Mission School. So St. Philip's Mission School was supported by Trinity Cathedral Episcopal Church. And so this was a mission school. And this is where uh, people of African heritage, Asians, at that time of Chinese, and also um, Indians were able to attend the mission school. And so at the mission school, some of the um, teachers from the San Francisco schools and from the Sacramento school would come and teach at the mission school. Phil, uh, Philip Cassie also established what is called Dixonian Institute. 
and they were able to acquire the 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 um, a home that was uh, the known as the Bascom home, and this is where he established the Fixoyan Institute. Uh, and this was the Fixoyan Institute was a school for high school students, and people from all over the country, uh, African Americans, sent their their students to the Fixoyan Institute to um, learn um, for education. Here's an example, the, Cal the San Jose, California. Uh, this was the newspaper at the time, and it says in the middle, San Jose School for Colored Children. And so P Peter William Cassie, principal. And so this was an advertisement for the school, an advertisement in the local newspaper. And so, uh, and here's a wonderful photograph of uh, not necessarily students from from William Cassidy School, but these were students from the Sacramento School, and he was also connected with that school too. In the 1850s, San Jose and other Bay Area cities established black schools, and San Francisco had what was called the Color School in San Francisco, and there was also a school in Sacramento. <coughs> During that time, we had uh, the the White family owned a barber shop. In between the in the eighteen between the eighteen sixties and 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 eighteen eighties, we have also the formation of what, of what was called the Afro American League, and um, Jacob Over, uh, Over, Overton and other black men from the community formed this Afro American League, and they fought for the voting rights. Now, even though after the Civil War, uh, black men had gained the right to vote under the night. Uh, I'm sorry. It, anyway had the right to vote. The problem in San Jose was, or not just San Jose, but in, in this part of California, was that many uh, found it very difficult to, to vote. So in other words, even though the polls were, uh, black people had the right to vote, it was difficult for black men to, to vote. So this Afro League uh, came together and they, and they, they worked with the they worked with the, the organizations in San Jose to overcome some of the problems with voting. And then they also were very instrumental in overcoming the discriminatory law that would not allow blacks to, um, uh, to testify against whites. And then um, I wanted to include the story of Edmona Lewis. So basically Edmona Lewis uh, was a very uh, uh, well-respected sculpturist. And the reason why her story is in the book is because even though she's not from San Jose, she never she didn't live in California. But the reason she's in the book is because she was a world renowned sculpturist. And um, so what happened is that her work was purchased in California uh, by uh, the Overtons. And then they they um, by I'm sorry, by the Knox family and the Knox family then dedicated her work as a gift to San Jose's public library. And this was in the 1870s. And so the public library accepted this gift from, from the Knox family. And the Knox family was a very uh, uh, important and, and very wealthy family in San Jose. And so today on the fifth floor in the California room at the San Jose library, you will see the wonderful sculptures that were created by Edmona Lewis. I, 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 I'm sure some of you are, are wondering, where did she get that photograph of Edmona Lewis? <laughs> Well, it's important because her work is housed. This is this is the only place in the world where, where we can actually see the work of Edmona Lewis. But I had to go all the way to the Portrait Museum in, in, in Washington, DC <laughs> on one of my summer vacation trips to, of going to museums all over the country. And uh, we, had, we went to the museum and I was able to, the National Portrait Gallery, and I was able to get this, to obtain this photograph. So, um, and the photograph of, of, the, of the bust of Abraham Lincoln that she, that she actually sculptured is now available at the San Jose Public Library. So there's actually three, let's see if I have the others. Oh, I don't. Okay, so she actually uh, created three pieces. So one is April, well, three pieces that, it, that are on display and one is the, um, the bust of Abraham Lincoln. And the other um, two are, both of them are called awake and one is called asleep. And so these are both children holding each other. One's awake and they're waking up and the other one is, is, is the child asleep. Um, but all three of the busts are 
on display. So if you'd like to go to the San Jose Public Library, you will see the work of Edmona Lewis. And I understand this is the only place in the country that currently still today uh, has her work on display. Well, chapter two is devoted to the black church. And the reason I, I devoted in all of my books, there's I've devoted one chapter to the black church. So you're probably wondering why. Well, because the black church is very significant in the black community, always has been and still is today. So it was a black church where the black community came together and would celebrate together, have picnics. And it was sort of like the, the place for catching up with the latest news, hearing what's going on and also this is a place for where, where this was the organization that provided the services that were needed for the community. So the school was established in the black church. The San Francisco school was established in the basement of the, of the church. The San Jose school, St. Phil's mission was established and not necessarily in a black church, but, but it was a white church that helped support the mission, but it was under the auspices of Cassie, William Cassie. And so William Cassie went on to help establish the first AME Zion Church, which was established in, in 1863 here in San Jose. And, and this was, um, and the Zion Church was located, what is today known as uh, San Jose State on the campus. Um, let me give you specifically the street. Uh, uh, so it's not, it was at the time, the original location was 4th and San Antonio Street. And that was where the original church was uh, was developed was built, uh, but then then uh, after urban renewal, which would have been around 1970s or so, the church then was was torn down, and the members of the church moved to 20th Street, and that's where First Amy Zion exists today. So this is a congregation that is still one of our early churches that that's, that is still here. Um, then we also had Antioch Baptist Church, which was started in 1893, and um, Antioch Baptist Church was started in North San Jose, and it is still in 1893, and this church structure is still there today. So in my book, I was so fortunate that I was able to acquire the original, a photograph of the original church, and um, so it is not, this is not the original church on the left that you're looking at that says Antioch Baptist Church, but um, so the church now, but it is at the original location. So the church was located originally, was built originally on Julian Street. And so this is the, a, new, a newer version of the church. But what I understand is that the actual part of, below the steeple was some of the original, was the actual parts of it may have been, may, I don't know if it's still the original building itself, but the, but the building, the original, the shape of it is still, uh, on that particular lot. And that was a church that was uh, developed in 1893. And then we have AME's, uh, University AME Zion Church in Palo Alto, which is another black, one of the early black churches. And it exists. Um, and this is a photograph of the uh, original church that was built in 1918, 19, 19, I'm sorry. Um, but it has of course been remodeled and upgraded. So the black church was very instrumental in, in uh, serving as a center point of the black community and uh, the many of the organizations such as the NAACP after the turn of the century, those organizations were, were housed right in the black church or they, they were able to, uh, to operate in the black church and uh, many uh, businesses would, would, were able to advertise in the black church. So black church was, was sort of like, was a center point of the community and still is today. Well, during the great migration years of the 1910s to 1940s, many African-Americans migrated from the Southern states of Oklahoma, Texas, and Arkansas. In the 1900s, the black population uh, grew to 251 by, by 1900 out of, six, out of 60, 000 out of a total of 60,000. So that's pretty small, 251, few numbers. But by 1950, the black population grew to 1,718 out of 290,000. Well, the still, the black population is still pretty, pretty, um, pretty, pretty small, but by 1960, the population grew to 4,000. But then by the 1990s, it grew to 55,000. And so you're probably wondering, well, what happened between the 1960s and 1990s? Well, what happened is technology. 
and, and job opportunities after World War uh, two, there are many job opportunities and many, and, and also educational opportunities that brought African Americans to the valley. Today, the black the black population is three percent of the total population, which is at thirty one thousand, and uh, is thirty one thousand of the total. I'm sorry, the black population is three percent of thirty one thousand out of one point two million. In Santa Clara County today, as of twenty nineteen. The black population is 49,308 out of 1.9 million residents. And uh, what is also interesting that is happening is that many of the, uh, well, there's a percentage of the 49,000 are actually people from uh, Ethiopia. So the black population has actually uh, grown beyond just um, those from the United States, but also immigrants from other uh, countries on, on the Af from the Af African continent. Um, okay, so, so I, I began to ask myself, okay, so who are some of these people? Who are some of the early trailblazers? Who are some of the people who are the visionaries who contributed in a big way uh, to the development of the Black community or of communities in general? And so the first person um, that I want to mention is Sam McDonald. And Sam McDonald is important because he was first born, he was born in um, Chino, California, and his family moved, from, and they were farmers, they're farm workers, they're actually farm laborers. And family worked on farms in Chino, uh, and then decided to move to Gilroy and worked, in, worked on farms in Gilroy. And this was in the 1890s. Uh, at that point, the family decided to move to the state of Washington, Oregon and Washington to farm, I believe, beets or something. Well, young Sam McDonald was uh, on, on horseback. And the story has it that he, after, after leaving California and, and traveling through to Oregon, he decided it was too cold and he didn't want to leave California and wanted to return and go back to, he didn't want to leave California for Oregon and decided halfway, told his dad that he wanted to go back to California. And so he arranged to, his dad helped him and he arranged to, to, uh, to travel back to California on horseback at 17 years old uh, by himself with another group of people who were also going to California. And so he, he, with just his, whatever few items he had and was able to borrow on the horse, he made his way back to California. Well, he came to San Jose and the story has it, he, he wrote an autobiography and uh, he, in his autobiography, he describes working as a laborer on uh, the railroad and he worked on different farms, doing different farm work. He had a, just a variety of, of jobs. Eventually he made his way to Palo Alto and he was hired to work uh, uh, in the city of Mayfield. And he did, had various jobs uh, in Mayfield, he worked at, he was called a constable. <laughs> he had a job as a constable. So as, uh, in, his, in, his, in his writings, he refers to, uh, he, he was an assistant, did like a deputy to, to the sheriff. Uh, uh, eventually he, uh, they began working on, at Stanford, um, what he returned terms the Stanford Farms. And uh, from 1903 to 19, uh, from 1903 to 1954. Well, throughout his time working at Stanford, he uh, began to acquire property, and uh, he acquired he acquired land, and he uh, purchased over 400 acres. Before he died, he donated those 400 acres to Stanford, of which Stanford, after he died, Stanford, and oh, he do donated it to Stanford with the understanding that that uh, the land would go towards some kind of recreational public use. And then Stanford sold the land to the, to, uh, the county of San Mateo. And so we see today what is called the San McDonald Park. One of his favorite activities while he was working at the Stanford, uh, at, the, at Stanford was to um, volunteer his time at the children's, a disadvantaged children's convalescent home. And he was known to help prepare barbecues for the children. He did handyman work. He helped, he, he entertained the children, he often, so that was his secondary, that was his, his family. 
so to speak. And and uh, eventually, after he died, they termed his the convalescent home the McDonald home. And then Stanford eventually uh, purchased the McDonald home, and then it became a part of the Stanford Hospital facility. But he, so we think of the McDonald, Ronald McDonald. No, it was Sam McDonald. <laughs> Uh, so uh, he was, so he, that was, he was, it was named McDonald Home in honor of his dedication, devotion to um, the children of the convalescent home. Then Palo Alto, we have Seaman Harris, who um, ran a boot, boot black shop in, the 18, uh, in 1896 on the Stanford campus. And there are wonderful stories about how his his own his son then continued his business ventures of his dad. The Harris family still live in Palo Alto today. We have a person, a young person by the name of Ivy Anderson. Ivy Anderson is from Gilroy, California. And Ivy lived in Gilroy from 1903 to 1970 to 1917. She attended Gilroy High School. Well, she's kind of important because even after she became, she, well, let me just say, she was a wonderful singer. And so uh, when you research her life, you, everything I find, I've read about her is that she loved singing and, and she loved sharing her music with everyone while she was a high school student. But, well, later she, she went to New York or Washington, no, I'm sorry, she went to Washington DC and she uh, then uh, uh, attended a music academy of some type. Uh, eventually she joined the Duke Ellington band but she didn't leave, she didn't forget about Gilroy. She went back to Gilroy often and she was known to have visited Gilroy. To, she brought Duke Ellington to Gilroy. It was a family there, the Parcell family, who um, she used to live across the street. She grew up from the Parcell family. And I had an experience when, as I was researching Ivy Anderson um, at the Historical Society, one of the members, one of the workers told me oh, you know, you ought to go to the Parcel Music Company. They've got pictures of her on the wall. And I went and there was pictures of uh, Ivy Anderson with, uh, with, with other, um, other uh, musicians um, uh, on the wall there. And to, so even today, and I asked if I could scan some of the photographs and no, 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 no. <laughs> it was, they were just prized family possessions, but I was able to get one photograph of, uh, of Ivy Anderson and she's, a person who is highly respected in Gilroy and also at Gavilan uh, College because of her contribution to the college and to the town in terms of music and Duke Ellington performed there and, and, her, and she traveled around the world for many years singing and performing. Um, in San Jose, the Ribb family made their home in San Jose. Henry and Clyde Ribbs uh, migrated to San Jose from the South. Uh, they left the South because of racism, and they but came to San Jose, started a plumbing business, and then Clyde Ribs came to San Jose in 1919 and started a transfer company. The Ribs family uh, members uh, uh, no longer live in San Jose, but the business is still is still operating in San Jose. One of the Ribs sons sons became a very famous uh, race car car driver, so that's a family of uh, a, a black family from San Jose. Then my next chapter deals with educational opportunities, 1950s to 1960s. And so I kind of felt it was sort of important to highlight San Jose State. And the reason for this is because many black athletes were able to um, come and, and, and um, either join the track and field team that recruited to run as athletes for track in the track and field as also football players and some basketball players, but primarily football and track and field, and I think some wrestling. And so this was the way African-Americans were able to get an education and many took advantage of that opportunity and then uh, pursued professions and other career paths. Um, one of the problems that many of the black athletes had was that they were not able to find suitable housing in San Jose. And so what happened because of redlining and housing discrimination in terms of rentals, wanting to rent property and rent housing, and also much of the much of the housing on campus during the during the 1950s, early 60s was um, was segregated, and so there was not black housing, and so many athletes had to find a place to live in the homes of black families who rented rooms, and also 
uh, one of the things that happened is that some of the athletes came together and they were able to rent a house and they called it the Good Brothers Pad. And many of them were able to live in the Good Brothers Pad uh, uh, throughout their years of attending San Jose State. So these were some, these are the photograph on the top are some of the athletes that what was termed the Speed City era where there's John Carlos there and there's also others who became um, outstanding, who were outstanding world-class athletes. And so San Jose State was able to recruit world-class athletes. And this was one way that African-Americans came to San Jose for an education at San Jose State. Uh, there's a photograph of Dr. Harry Edwards, who was a student athlete at San Jose. So it was called San Jose State College at that time. He was a, he was a student athlete in four different sports in 1961. In 1968, after graduating from San Jose State and going on to Cor uh, Cornell University, he got his PhD, came back to San Jose State in 1968 and taught so uh, sociology. He founded what was called the Olympic Project for Human Rights in 1967. And the purpose of that was to address the treatment towards black athletes and housing was one of them and, and other uh, issues that athletes were facing. Um, on the left is the statue. So you, we know about the uh, 1968, um, 1968 Olympics in Mexico City. And so there is a statue of John Carlos and Tommy Smith uh, on the statue with the raised fist. Uh, and this statue today is a replica of the statue which is located on the campus of San Jose State University commemorating the demonstration of the black athletes. And, and the reason they have the raised fist is because of some of the human rights issues that they were facing and trying to overcome during the 1960s and, and discrimination, racial discrimination of the 60s. Chapter five, 1950s and 1990s. And so in this chapter, I deal with the first. And so I thought, okay, it's really important. When writing the book, I thought, okay, in terms of the contemporary period, well, we need to acknowledge those people who were the trailblazers, the first in their professions and fields. So we have, and I'm gonna kind of go through this quickly, I'm kind of watching my time. Um, we have Francis Tanner, who was the first black police officer. We have um, in 19, that was in 1950, and there's a photograph of him. Uh, he was a patrolman uh, um, on the street. Uh, was, so he helped people uh, cross the streets and did other things. Uh, but, in 1947, we have Philip Ellington, who became the first black mail carrier, and he was the first volunteer, volunteer auxiliary policeman. Then we have, um, in the 1980s, we have, 1992, we have the first black fire chief, Robert Osby. He was the chief of San Jose's fire department, and he hired the first black female firefighter. Then we had Walter Atkins on the right, and he served in the, in the police department from 1969 to 1998. He, uh, uh, he served at every level of the police department and rising to the level of chief, acting chief in 1998. So he was the very first uh, acting chief in 1998. We have the first uh, black uh, female firefighter who was hired by uh, Chief Osby, and her name was Teresa Dale Roach Reed. In 1986, she became the first female in the San Jose Fire Department. And then in 2012, she was the very first black fire chief of Oakland. Then we have in the criminal justice field, we have Ladoris Cordell, who was a Stanford graduate and served on the bench from 1982 to 2000 uh, the, in municipal court, family court, and superior court. And, and since serving, and she also served on the, on the city council for the city of Palo Alto. So she was the first in the criminal justice field to serve at, on the bench. We have also in criminal justice, the first African-American uh, public defender who worked in the public defender's office and that was Steve Stevens. And this is from 1972 to 1990. We have Ulysses Beasley, who was the first African-American prosecutor in the Santa Clara County District Attorney's Office. He retired in, in 1989, and he was the first uh, African-American assistant DA, deputy DA. Then we have uh, the first elected officials. We have city council member Iola Williams in 1970, served on the San Jose City Council. We have Roy Clay, 
who was a, a tech executive who served and uh, started his own company and he served on the Palo Alto City Council in the 1970s. We have also Ben Gross who served on the City Council for the city of Milpitas um, and from served as mayor from 1962 to 199, I'm sorry, from 1962 to 1971, city of, of uh, Melpitas. Community activist Inez Jackson helped to establish the African American Community Service Agency and the, and the Inez Jackson Library, and uh, Carl Ray, who established tours to send Black students to historical Black colleges. And those, even though these people have passed away, um, particularly Carl, Carl Ray, today, the trips and tours of the historical black colleges is still an activity that is available to black to black um, or to students of color. Or I think it's every any student actually is able to go on the tours now. Um, in education, first we have Dr. Brian Breland, who was the first African American Chancellor at San Jose uh, San Jose Evergreen San Jose Evergreen College Community College District. And we have Keith H, who was the very first president of Black, the very first Black president of Evergreen Valley College. And then we get into people in, um, in uh, uh, public service, uh, Tommy Fulcher, uh, who served as his Santa Clara County Economic and, and Social Opportunities Corporation. And then we get into technology. So we have Sandra McNeil of Morgan Hill, who created programs with the Chamber of Commerce to help teach uh, high school students employment skills and help them to get internship and jobs in technology. So pretty much um, my the rest of my, my PowerPoint here points out some people, Frank Green and Roy Clay and Wilbur Jackson who were trailblazers in technology. And IBM, uh, many of these people worked in, at IBM and uh, IBM recruited African-Americans, uh, provided housing for all employees and which, which got away from the redlining problem that existed in San Jose because uh, people, of, of, uh, people of color were able to live in, in, in corporate housing that was available um, in the San Jose area. So anyway, um, and I also want to mention at the end, uh, Debbie Thomas, she was the first African-American to win the bronze medal in the Winter Olympics in Calgary in 1988, where she was raised here in San Jose. She attended Stanford University. Uh, she attended San Jose State University, graduated from San Jose State, and then went on to Stanford University and studied medicine. And so she is uh, from San Jose. And then Eddie Gale, who's the ambassador of jazz. And I'm going to end here. Well, let's see. I want to just mention that um, my books are available at Arcadia Publishing Company. They're also available at Barnes and Noble and any other and local bookstores too. CBC stores and Walgreens stores also sell my books, as well as you can contact me at www.africanamericanhistories.com. I thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to share my my latest book with you and just talk about the contributions that African Americans have made in the Santa Clara Valley. Thank you very much for your time. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jan. Um, I, I think I can definitely speak on behalf of many of our audience members um, that your research is, is truly eye opening and uh, sheds light on a piece of history, uh, local history that hasn't really been critically examined enough. So, um, so thank you so much for, uh, for sharing your work with us. Um, so we'll go ahead and move straight into the Q&A portion of the evening. Um, thank you so much for everybody uh, who's written in with a lot of questions. Um, so I guess we'll just kind of take it away. Um, okay, so, um, so this is a really great question because um, this is also one of the reasons why I was so um, interested in Professor Adkins' work, especially in collections and uh, dealing with, you know, uh, looking through the archives and finding things that are buried. Uh, we were wondering if you could uh, describe your research or investigation process 
and speak a little bit about how you were able to find a lot of these resources and collections. Obviously, you know, this has been such a, a culmination of 15 years of work <laughs> that you had, had said. So if you could speak a little bit about that process. Well, the first step is I start by reading the history books of the local community. So the history books and I also, also read the local newspapers. So I started out in San Francisco with reading the very first black newspapers, the, um, um, the, pardon me, the elevator, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm from black, the elevator newspaper, Mirror of the Times, and the Pacific Appeal newspapers. And these are newspapers that were started in the 1850s. And many of these newspapers also discuss San Jose, Monterey, and there's lots of wonderful stories and, and wonderful, and, and many of the um, writers actually traveled to those places and gathered the stories and wrote the stories. In addition to the black newspapers, I also began reading some of the local newspapers, the early Mercury News, and there were other uh, uh, newspaper booklets, so to speak, that um, are written by different people from San Jose who had just enjoyed journalism. And they often wrote about the Black community. So these were people that were not necessarily African Americans who wrote about the Black community. So I start by reading as much as I can about the documented history, then the undocumented history. And then I begin by researching in the California room or History San Jose, I just research whatever is available about the black community. But, and so I go through family archives, I mean, family, family um, collections at the archives and I read the oral histories and some of them are written, some of them are audio taped and I listen to some of the stories. And so I gather my list of who were some of the early trailblazers. Um, there's actually been several wonderful books written about different time periods of the communities of California, but not specifically in terms of San Jose or, or, or the counties that I've covered. And so I've had to, to pull together this, this information from a variety of sources to try to, to try to understand the community and get a, get a feel for the evolution of the community and the trailblazers in the communities. So, and, and from there, each book, um, to, I researched for about three to four years. So each book took about three to four years to write um, and then to collect the images. Um, and initially I found myself, I, I love photographs. And so, and I love that. I love studying about pioneers, the 18, 17, 1800s. I just love that. And so what I find, what happens is that when I read a story, then the next step, I'm, I, I think, okay, what did he look like? What did, <laughs> Where, where did he live? And so I find myself wanting to know more and more about a person. And, and then, then, then I began to search for photographs. So that's how I came, I arrived at writing a book that included both photographs as well as information about the, you know, about the individual. And the Arcadia has the perfect format for the kind of writing that I enjoy doing. So that's basically, oh, let me, let me go on to say, now, I, I don't want you to think that then I just take it from there. No, no, I depend upon librarians, archivists, and historical societies, because then I start knocking on their doors and I start going through all of their stuff. And I start asking, consulting the archivist as to, well, did you know about so-and-so and who, do, and so, yes, my, my research also involves many, many people throughout the state who also enjoy studying local history and they're there to, to give me lots of information and, and share their photographs. And, and it's been a wonderful journey though. And I've met so many wonderful people. Oh, that's so wonderful, Jan. Yeah, I know you've done so much research and I actually have a copy of Jan's book here. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, again, just, I was so astounded by um, the level of meticulous research that you've done. And I can just, I, I can tell that you've spent a lot of time uh, mm -hmm. in the archives. So thank you so much. I mean, this is, this is truly a gift for public education. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So let's see. So we do have a lot of questions. Uh, okay. Hopefully we'll get to um, answer all of them. Um, so we did have some questions uh, in regards to the relationship and interaction between uh, different communities of color. Um, so one of the questions that we had was, what kind of a relationship and interaction 
did uh, African Americans and Native Americans have? And can you speak to uh, anything about that? You know, um, it's quite sad, but um, no, there's not a lot of documentation other, other than to say that from what I can tell from my research, the Ohlone Indians who primarily occupied the land here in this valley uh, were pretty much, um, uh, I don't wanna say, uh, they were pretty much eliminated in terms of the land and their uh, involvement with the missions and with the Pueblo. But that would have been the, that would have been the time where there may have been some interaction. And as, as a matter of fact, I, I, and I'm still trying to document that the interaction between the Lonies and the black community, and I, I'm not able to find much at all. And it has to do with the fact that, that once once the land was settled uh, by the Spaniards and, and, and the missions were established, I think that the Ohlone Indians were eventually uh, pushed off the land. It's quite sad, but that's what I've been able to find in my research. But it's a, it's a very sad story, but we need to honor the fact that this land was, was, you know, was occupied and was, was you know, that there were people that lived on this land before we came here. And so, yeah, there's not much of a connection. Other than other, I was, I guess I was able to document though that at Phillips, uh, St. Philip's mission, the Native Americans, uh, the Indians attended the mission school and so did the Chinese and, so, and so did black students too. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I think that segues into another question. Um, so one of our attendees tonight has done quite a bit of research on the Asian American community oh. here in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as you know, they've been the forefront of so many discriminatory laws um, mm -hmm. against minority groups, just right. as you pointed out. Um, do you know to what extent the African Americans have worked with Asian Americans in their fight against racist policies and laws? Well, yeah. Now, and spe specifically, the uh, the the right to testify law, the, the to overturn that law, um, the Chinese could not testify against a white person, and the um, a Indians could not testify against a white person. Neither could people of African heritage either. So, in other words, only a white person could testify. Nobody else could testify during that time, and that law was finally. Um, overturned in, I believe, the early uh, 1860s. So during that time, um, those communities, well, those individuals were affected by that law and the Colored Convention and the Afro-American League and others fought to overturn that law. Now, um, later in education, uh, when, the, when the schools were desegregated in, in the late 1800s, about 1880s, 1890s, and there was also, it was desegregated for black students. And so it wasn't until after uh, the 1930s, early 1940s, when the schools were, when the language, so even though the schools were, um, were desegregated for Asians and Indians, still the language wasn't taken out of the codes until I understand in my research, it was the 1940s. And so there was an effort to make sure that that discriminatory language was removed from the code. That doesn't necessarily mean that that discriminatory action took place, but the language was still in the in the in the California uh, education codes that the schools were segregated in terms of Asian and uh, Indians. So that was kind of sad. Um, another area where there was a coordination or cooperation happened both in San Jose and San Francisco from my research. And that is um, when the Japanese uh, were interned and were taken out of San Jose. And there, so in some cases they were able to make agreements with black families to hold on to their property until they returned. Now I wanted, I have to caution as I say this because I have to say that I worked so hard trying to prove that. I was mm -hmm. told it happened by both, by both Japanese Americans and, and black Americans, but I could not find the documentation. But I understand 
and I'm still I'm still searching <laughs> yeah. for to find out where to what extent was did that cooperation happen? And I was told it happened right here in San Jose, in Japantown. And so, but I can't prove that. But I understand the Black community was very sympathetic. Um, a Black church exists there today that was there at that time that existed at that time. It was a prayer garden. And, and so there was a cooperation between the, the, the two communities because the black community was, the initial community started in North San Jose, which is mm -hmm. also where Japan town is. And at that time, much of that property was owned by Japanese Americans. And they of course were interned. And so that was that, com that community kind of abutted the black community. And so there was, from what I understand, and I can't prove it, there was a sense of cooperation between the Japanese, but, but it was probably on a family by family level. I see, I see. Yeah, yeah I, I would definitely say, I mean, sometimes, you know, we're so at the mercy of trying to find materials, right, to, to prove a lot of these things. And so if I could just put in a plug to our, our audience this evening, um, you know, please, if there are any artifacts that you have even in your own family collection, right? I, this is something that we talked about, Jan, right? So yeah. um, it's, uh, it, it, you know, it definitely helps for future research and, um, and finding answers. Yeah. So, yes. Wonderful. Okay, so I know we have a lot of questions to get through. Um, so one uh, attendee was curious, who was your favorite person to research uh, during your process? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Many. Being an educator, I, yeah. my first question, every time I am researching a new city, it's like, what about the schools? Where is evidence of the very first black schools? And I think it was just realizing that, that schools, education was so important. And, mm -hmm. and, and I'm not surprised, but education was so important to, to black families. So when families came west and, and they found land and, and started a farm and built a house, the next step was well, we want our kids educated so the kids can have better opportunities than the, than, than the parents, you know? And, and it, that was the struggle. So they would establish their own schools. And, mm -hmm. and so that was probably, I, I mean, I love that. I love the stories of, and also I have to tell you, one of yeah. my favorite stories happens to be the miners because the miners who mine the fields in Sacramento of Placerville County, they left, once they're able to, to buy their freedom, they then left those area that, that the mines and they came to San Francisco, San Jose, Santa Clara Valley, and they established their homes here, you know, just like James Williams at Murphy Ranch, you know? And so that was exciting to me to see that, that, that that instead of just going back to the south and living in a in bondage, black people sought freedom right. and farm land and farm the land and worked as laborers, working to support their families, providing schools. Families and men on the train. And and it was exciting, yeah. And there were families who in my in my Monterey book who actually met. Uh, uh, on a train, you know, traveling out west, you know, and wonderful and reading and hearing the family stories, reading about the families and, and why they came west, the Ribs family and why they were discriminated against so badly and left the late at night traveling out west to get away from, apparently they were being hunted by some <laughs> white, somebody, you know, who was after them and they left and they, and they decide to establish their home and their families are still here today. I, I love those family stories. <laughs> and I'm so happy to know that your museum is going to maintain a collection of these family stories because part of the problem is that it's like, well, what do you do? What do, what do you do with the stories? What do you do with these photographs? Many families, you know, a person dies and the kids don't know the value of the, of the photographs and toss them away. And Absolutely. in some cases, churches, church records have been tossed. But it's wonderful when I go to the library and I find the old church records of some of the old of the old first black churches are housed right in the libraries and museums are be, have become a center, a collection point for family history. So I think my favorite part is just, just learning about the families and individuals and, 
and how they survived, you know, and how they established their families and their roots and how they yeah. flourished. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, and on that note, uh, one of our, our attendees is wondering, are you planning to research the African-American community in the East Bay? Uh, will you be expanding <laughs> your region out? <laughs> I always get that question. So I want you to know, yes, I have a new, I'm starting a new um, five-year <laughs> adventure. And this one is going to be about historic trailblazers of the Bay Area, which will include the East Bay. Wonderful. Yeah. And so I'm really excited. And it's going to, I think I'm going to publish it under History Press, which is a little different than, um, than the, the Arcadia uh, Images of America series. And this will allow photographs along with more text. So more storytelling about the individual families. And so and I'm going to focus on the trailblazers, those that were the visionaries that started out first and had to make their way, those early pioneers who, who've opened the doors for so many people who came here when it was so impossible. And there are many, many stories of the East. So but this will allow me to bring the three counties that I've written about together and then expand over into the East Bay and then bring it so we have a, a, a clear picture of Bay Area visionaries and trailblazers that helped to establish the Black communities uh, throughout the Bay Area. So which would in, be include Richmond, um, Oakland, Vallejo, and Fremont, mm -hmm. and then San Mateo County. So that's a lot. <laughs> But I really want to, you know, the problem with me is that I want to hear the whole story. And when you, right. when you get part of the story, and then you read that, and then they establish their home in Oakland, I'm like, oh, okay, but what happened when they went to Oakland? <laughs> so yeah, you, you almost have to get a kind of a Bay Area view of some of these early families and, and some of the visionaries and trailblazers. Oh, yeah. wonderful. Oh, yes, wonderful. I, that's my next project, and I've already started working on it. Oh, well, we'll have to have you back, <laughs> for sure. So, but you'll um, see me knocking on the door. Because I found out there's some people that I didn't even know about in, uh, in let's see, in Sunnyvale, in Cupertino, right. and, and Los Altos. So now I, I, I and so yeah. I consider, I'm not going to just include those that I've already included in my books. I'm also going to look at others that should have been included and 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 I and understand how they themselves contributed to the overall development of their community. So yeah, there's there's some others. Yeah. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Um, just a few more questions, and I think we'll go ahead and wrap up. Uh, but on the topic of Los Altos, you know, obviously we're the Los Altos History Museum. Uh, one of our attendees was wondering that um, although it was not in your book. Did you encounter any historical records of African Americans in Los Altos, and in particular, perhaps in agriculture or agriculture industry? Well, um, there what I discovered through the museum at the archives at De Anza College that there was a significant uh, person who worked uh, in farming in Cupertino and uh, Los Altos area. And I'm not quite sure that, I mean, this was early during the 1800s and so the land, you know, boundaries, I don't know where they're, so, but from that area going up towards uh, Los Altos. And so there, there was a family and I don't, and I could never identify uh, the family. Uh, I'd heard, I'd I was given a few names, but, I just didn't have time to dig further into discovering who that family is and where they, where they, you know, where they settled and what mm -hmm. farmland they actually occupy. Yeah, but they're supposedly, and there also is a story about a ranch hand who was very popular and instrumental in doing some spectacular things. And, and I wasn't able to get to the bottom of that. So that information came from the De Anza College a historical, um, I think they've got an archive of some type. And I, so yeah, so I have that, I, I need to, I want to research a little further with the Sunnyvale and the De Anza College um, uh, archives. 
So there's some information. I just don't know who these individuals are yet. I see. I see. Yeah. Okay. And uh, a couple more questions. Uh, what types of obstacles did the African Americans find, or did African Americans find when uh, legally allowed to vote? For example, uh, were there people blocking the voting venue? Uh, how did people vote in California then? Well, I think that what happened is that uh, African Americans were, were, well, there was an attempt to intimidate. And remember, these were men. And so, yeah, men. And so um, there was an effort to intimidate them as they went to the polls. And they had to go to the polls in groups. But the colored convention came together and they focused on the, the issue of voting. And, um, but yes, um, I, 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 from what I gather, it was primarily um, the, the pressure upon the men uh, as they went to the polls. So where is this information documented? In the black newspapers. So mm -hmm. there are lots of articles. And, and I read that the way I was able to access the black newspapers is through the library, the San Francisco library. Uh, houses the black newspapers and I was able to read and I read lots of stories and articles about um, you know we're going to the polls today or whatever different groups would would have different activities for voting and let's go you know they went to the polls together and just different issues voting seemed to be an issue that that was a uh, pretty uh, popular in the newspapers so from what I gather it was intimidation um, uh, when they reach the polls, uh, not not going alone, but going in groups and having a strategy for voting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. All right. So I think we'll ask uh, two more questions, and I think we will end the program here. Um, did you find any relatives of the early African American San Joseans still living in San Jose? Uh, yes, actually, I had a chance to interview Peter William Cassie's, uh, I think she must be great granddaughter. And she doesn't live in San Jose anymore. But when Trinity uh, Cathedral Church found out that I was writing this book, they actually gave me the name of a person who knew her. And I was able to research I was able to contact her and she met with me right here in San Jose and she talked to me about uh, her great great grandfather and she had lots of information lots of records and lots of information told me you know he, he Philadelphia and she had a lot of written documentation and church records about him and so I met her uh, also the Overton family well the Overton family members are dead uh, but they are buried here in San Jose at the San Jose uh, uh, at this, yeah, they're buried in San Jose. I think I noted in my book exactly where Oak, uh, where are they? Um, Oak Hill. Oak Hill, yes, the Oak Hill was where they're buried. So the Overton, uh, Jacob Overton and, and his wife, he married Sarah Overton. Oh yeah, they have a, pam a family plot at Oak Hill Cemetery in San Jose. Um, so that family does not exist. I understand the Horton family is still here, uh, and I I would love to to interview the Horton family because there's uh, San Jose has quite a collection of of family uh, stories and memorabilia, and the Horton family is one family. Uh, I had a chance to, I met the John Jordan and his wife Rosalind Guest who um, built their house in San Jose on North Eleventh uh, Street in 1909. I had a chance to interview Robert Ellington. And at the time I interviewed him, he was the, so Robert Ellington was the grandson. And at the time I interviewed Robert Ellington, he was, I wanna say 92 years old and he died shortly. And this has happened with all of my books. I have interviewed some key, so precious, so precious and key people and they pass away before my book comes out. And so I did get a chance to, to, to interview him. And he was on a walker and he, was, he, ha he had started a, a food bank at his church at um, 
there at uh, Antioch Baptist Church. And on Saturday, he was there giving out food to the homeless, 90 years old with his walker. And this was a program that he started many years ago. Well, he was, he lived in the original house that his grandparents built on North 11th Street. He mm -hmm. lived in, in that house. So at the time I interviewed him, he gave me his address. I took a picture of the house. The house is, is in the book too. <laughs> the, the original, so, so in the book is the original Ellington house. And so he died. He was the last person to live in the house, but he does have grandchildren, children mm -hmm. and grandchildren. And I had a chance to interview his daughter. So the Jordan family, I, I oh. the founders of uh, Antioch Baptist Church. So I did have a chance to meet that family and several generations of that family. So it was really, it was such a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful experience. And even today, every once in a while, I'll get a text message from one of the Ellingtons, you know, are you saved? Are you saved during the COVID? And yes, I'm fine, thank you. <laughs> it's, it's so wonderful, yeah. So yeah, but those are, but, but it, was, it was great. Cassie, can you believe that? His great, great, great granddaughter. Yeah, it was, it was, it was shocking. And then um, when my book came out, I was able to mail them copies of the books and, you know, to make sure their family members had lots of, had copies. And uh, so it was, it was wonderful. Yeah. Oh, that's so wonderful. That's so wonderful. So I think I will ask the final question of the night. And uh, I think this is a really important question as well. Um, could you speak to us a little bit about uh, sort of your thoughts on how history of African Americans are taught in public schools? Um, and if you could also get us share with us a sense of um, sort of the percentage of uh, black professors, instructors in local colleges or universities uh, near here and and sort of share with us the future of um, how how we can better study this history and what we can do to be um, active participants in um, making sure that this type of history is reported. Well, I one of the things that has happened is that we have this, and I'm not making a plug for Arcadia, please, <laughs> but the <laughs> No, seriously, no, no, it's not, it could be any publishing company, but the fact that publishers now are encouraging local people to write about local history, that, that has made, has, has changed, I think, the access and the, and the documentation of local history. And I think that, and, and this encourages a history by local groups and organizations and and not just ethnic groups, but religious groups and organizations to write their history rather than waiting for someone in ivory tower someplace to write a history book. Uh, right. So I think that the, just the availability of local history books like the Arcadia books and others who focus, who, who, um, whose um, general focus is about local history, I think that that has made all the difference um, because, because, um, I'm going back to the days when I loved, I loved studying history even as a child in, in high school and in college. I minored in history. And so uh, I took every history course that was available. But um, what happened is that I, I was eager because I really wanted to know. I wanted to know about the black cowboys, you know? I wanted to know, you know, about black pioneers and what did they do? How did they travel? But the history books do not include information about, about ethnic groups and, and not even black, but you can look at, you know, how did some of the Hispanic families travel from Mexico into California? What, you know, you wanna know about these things. What, how, the Ohlone Indians, you wanna know about the Indians, but it's not well documented. And so that was discouraging for me. Uh, I, I think that, and then for me not to see anything about the black community in our history books over the years, um, it was discouraging. I became a teacher and as a teacher then, you know, we, we try to provide historical background for teaching literature. And so many of the books we read, um, when I try to find out about black, you know, the black community, I, I didn't have the information. It was my, the, what got me started were my students. So they'd ask, one day they just asked the question, what were black people doing, doing during this time? I'm like, it, what? What were black people doing? <laughs> oh, probably like everybody else. 
farming? But they say, well, who, where, when? I like, I don't know. <laughs> so then I told my students, I said, well, you know, why don't you go find out and come back and write a, write a research paper, <laughs> write a book report right. and come and, and report to the class. And, and then, um, I, so I was like, I'm like, really? And so my students turned to me and they said, well, why don't you find out? Can you go find out and give us some information? I'm like, oh, so the tables were turned. And here I am teaching literature and they're asking me about the historical background of a particular community. <laughs> In that case, at that when that question came up, we were studying John Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath. <laughs> We're talking about traveling from Oklahoma to California. And they wanted to know what was the black community like in California? I mean, I had no answers. So I, I went back to, I, I was in college working on my master's degree and I decided to, um, that, I would, that I would study California, lit, California literature as it relates to the black community. Well, there was nothing. And so I started by reading the black newspapers and I started reading all the newspapers about the black community and then I just started digging and I wrote my master's thesis and it was about the literature of written as written as published in the black newspapers of the 1800s. And so that started it and I would always share with my students what I found and they were so interested in everything. <laughs> and, um, and so I, I had a in fact I had a student and she was from uh, her family was from Greece and she said, well, what about the Greek community? I said, you know what? We can we need to study that too. You know, so, <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, I mean, there are so many different students had, and I, so we started out by I had them can begin to do their, write their oral history of, for their, of their families and to share that in the classroom. And so we had little oral history projects and kids loved it. And then that gave me excuse to keep researching the black community so that I can come back with information to share with them too. And it was, it was wonderful. But, um, but it has changed today though, because in the state of California, the legislature did pass um, uh, some, I don't know, some kind of a direct directive uh, last year that uh, ethnic studies need, should be taught uh, or at least including yeah. ethnic communities should be taught at both the high school level and the college level. So of course we have ethnic studies at the college levels now, but the, just the encouragement at the high school level and the middle school, it's so important. If you study California history and you don't study about the different uh, ethnic groups and, and their history in California, you're, you're missing so much. There's just so much to learn, you know? And I didn't even know there's something called Negro Bar in Placerville. Yeah, I found oh. that out and, it, and there's a plaque and it, the reason oh, okay. is because that's where black miners were able to mine. They couldn't mine for their own personal goal uh, where white miners mined, but they were able to mine for themselves in what it was called Negro bar. Bar not being a bar where you drink beer, bar meant <laughs> bar <of> gold. <laughs> I thought, oh when I first heard it, I thought, oh, this must have been a bar where they gathered. <laughs> no, <laughs> a bar of gold. And that's where, so there's in Placerville today, there's a big, there's a big monument where, and this is where blacks were able to mine and, and they were, became very wealthy, able to buy their freedom, buy the freedom of their families, brought their families out and moved to California. And uh, so there's lots of wonderful stories and wonderful all of these things are just so intriguing to me. Um, so, oh yes. But we well, see this now in our history. Our history is changing. And now the history is becoming more inclusive. What we have to be careful of is that people do not retell the stories. Like to say that slaves were uh, laborers, you know? And so we see right. a lot of this revisionist history going on. And no, slaves were not laborers. They, they, they were slaves. And so we Absolutely. need to make sure that the history that we tell is true and accurate and that we honor and we celebrate the accomplishments of all people, regardless of ethnic groups and organizations and religions, whatever, but that we honor each other's culture. We honor each other's contribution and we document it. We document the culture. And I'm just delighted to be a part of your museum's um, event tonight. And I'm and I'm I will contact you to see. Yes, <laughs> you definitely. Know for my next book. <laughs> oh, good, good, good. Well, 
Thank you so much, Jan. I mean, I think you said that just so beautifully. And, um, you know, we're so, so appreciative to um, have you with us tonight and just really share your work with us. And I think it's been just so enlightening. Um, so thank you so much again. It's truly an honor to, to be able to facilitate this event. So um, just uh, another plug, we do actually have copies of Jan's book um, at our museum. So please feel free to uh, check out our museum store online. Um, and of course, a very big thank you to everybody who has joined us from home. We really appreciate your time and uh, we look forward to bringing you more educational programs uh, such as this program tonight. If you have any questions, uh, you can always reach me at uh, research at losaltoshistory.org. Um, and we're, we're always uh, love to hear from you. So thank you very much um, everyone and take care, stay safe and have a wonderful night. Thank you. Thank you, Jan.